join us as we're heading on an amazing journey. We jump into the book of Joshua. It's a story of, well, it's about Joshua, but also the story about the people of Israel, also known as the Israelites. And it's also the story of God, and it's also our own story. The book starts with a dramatic introduction. Moses is dead. I know, right? And two million people have followed his leadership for decades as they've wandered in the desert, and now their leader is dead. Joshua is appointed to be the main leader and told by God that he shouldn't fear. Will Joshua be up to the task of taking the baton? Will the people fail again when it comes to choosing faith instead of fear? In the first chapters, they'll have to guide the Israelites through the supernatural splitting of the Jordan River, through the miraculous victory at Jericho when the walls came tumbling down, and through many other exciting adrenaline pumping battles. But mistakes will be made, prices will be paid, and lessons will be learned. And growth will happen, faith will be strengthened, and matured. Oh, and at one point, the sun stands still. Legit, just stands in the air because of an audacious prayer. There will be many inspiring characters like Joshua, Caleb, and Rahab, and even painful lessons like that of Bacon. <sighs> Where am I at? A minute 30? Okay, too much to cover. You're just gonna have to join us as we go through the book of Joshua. Well, good morning, New Hope. How are you guys doing? Just wanna take a moment and say welcome to everyone joining online. I'm so glad that you're with us, and my prayer is that you be ministered to wherever you're watching this, in your living room, in your bed, wherever you take this sermon, I pray that you would feel God's presence and you'd be ministered. I'm excited to kick off this series. Joshua is one of my favorite books in the Bible, and we're going to be looking at Joshua 1, so you can go ahead and turn there in your Bibles. And as we dive into this book the next several weeks, it's important for everyone to remember that Joshua's purpose was spiritual and not militaristic. Without Joshua's attachment to God, without his adherence to the law, without God fighting the battles for him, Joshua would never capture the promises that God had for him. He would never be able to accomplish the things that God had in store for him. Why? Because God had a plan and a promise that was a God-sized plan and a God-sized promise. And therefore, by himself, he could not accomplish those things. Now, just out of curiosity, does anyone ever get phone calls from, let's say, like a parent, uh, or let's just go with a dad, um, that the person just starts talking right away, assuming that you've been in their, their thoughts for like the last five minutes, and they just expect you just to jump on board in their little conversation in their head, and you've kind of got to pick up the pieces. Has anybody else happened that with their dad? I mean, uh, just anybody? Person? No? Just me? Yeah? Well, um, I think that it's a good idea anytime you call someone to give them some context as to why you are calling and not just jump into it. And in the same way, I want to give you guys some context of where we're going to be reading in our uh, scripture today in the book of Joshua. Because if we just jump to the book of Joshua and we don't know the history that leads up before it, then we're not going to be able to fully understand the scripture. Um, we need to, as Christians understand the importance of context and read the Bible within its context. Otherwise, bad theology is formed and we get these ideas that are not true because we pick and choose something. And how many know we're in the, the height of political season? Things get taken out of context all the time. If you take the text out of context, all you're left with is a con. So let's not do that. The book of Joshua gives the accounts of Israel being firmly established as, as a nation. And the prophet Moses had just uh, led Israel out of a captivity from the Egyptians and uh, parted the, the waters. And, and God was showing himself in many ways. There were many miracles. God sent food from heaven. He uh, gave water from a rock. He, 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 he parted the waters. There's a lot of different things that have happened. And Moses sends spies into the land that God has promised them. And the spies come back and 10 of them were afraid and two of them were not. And so 
the Israelites, out of fear and disobedience, decide not to go forward and take the promise that God had given them. And now they're stuck wandering in the desert and in the wilderness for 40 years. This whole time that Moses is leading the nation of Israel, Joshua is by his side. Joshua is being groomed and mentored. Joshua was a military commander. Joshua went up with Moses. Mo- went up with Moses to Mount Sinai and stayed at the base while Moses continued to ascend and received the Ten Commandments from God. It was known by all of Israel, it was known by Moses, and it was known by Joshua that Joshua was going to be appointed by God to be the next leader of Israel. And in the last chapter of Deuteronomy, Moses dies on Mount Nebo just outside the Promised Land. And now Joshua has been established by God And he's going to be the leader of Israel. Joshua was going to see the fruition of the promises that God had made decades prior. Can I just stop and encourage someone this morning that just because you never see the promises fulfilled by God in your lifetime, it doesn't mean that he's done working. Some of you are praying for a wayward son or a wayward daughter or grandchildren. Do not give up. Keep on pressing in and believe that what God says is true is true. And you hold on to those promises. And though you might not enter the promised land yourself, believe that what God has spoken to you is true. And and, and that God is not done working. Now, can anyone tell me... Uh, the main character of the book of Joshua. Let me take, take a, a wild guess. Trick question. The main co- character of the book of Joshua is not Joshua. It's God. It's always God. Didn't mean to set you guys up. You know, it's kind of like pulling the rug out from someone. It's like, ha, ha, no. God is always the main character. The purpose of these stories that we re- are recorded in Scripture are to point to God. It was God who tore down the walls of Jericho. It was God who made the sun stand still. It was God who led the Israelites and helped the Israelites defeat their enemies so that they could capture the promise of God. The main character in this book and all the stories and all the lessons that we learn from it all point to God and forecast to God. And so keep that in mind. Do not make the Bible about you. We need to keep the main thing the main thing, and that is God. Joshua chapter 1, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 9. Would you stand with me, and we're going to read this, and you can follow along on the giant Bible on the screen, or if you've got your own, even better. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people... Remember the word all in verse 2. All these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land that I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the great sea on the west. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from the left or to the right that you may be successful that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. God, right now, I pray that we would be strong and courageous knowing that you are with us and I pray that you would continue to to speak to hearts this morning, Lord. I pray that you would take this message that I believe you have given me, that you continue to work in my life in it, and that you would open up hearts, open up minds, and allow us to receive from your spirit this morning. Let faith rise up, let obedience flow from the faith, and may your spirit empower and enable us to do what you've called us to do. So help us, Jesus. We invite you here this morning. And everyone said, amen. You may be seated. 
The title of my message today is Securing the Promises of God. And I'm going to give you two things that will help you capture God's promises. But before I give you those two things, I want to ask this question. When God speaks something, does He really mean it? Is that taken as a promise? If God says, Austin, I'm going to meet you at Sycamore tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. and we're going to ride bikes. Was that a promise from God? Or is that just a maybe from God? Judging on God's character, who is perfect in character and in nature, and He cannot lie, when God speaks something to you, it is a promise. We don't need to hear the words, I promise you this, I promise. When God says it, He means it, and it's there, and He's going to be there, and we can take hold of that, and that is how God works in His nature. I remember when I was uh, first a college pastor in... Um, uh, the, the first probably couple months of being a college pastor and I was going to meet these two college students at Plaza Lanes, rest in peace Plaza Lanes burnt down and I got to the parking lot of Plaza Lanes and I sat in the parking lot they weren't there, I texted them, I said hey are you guys on your way, are we still good to, to go bowling, I was going to buy them pizza and pop and go bowling with these students and stuff, yeah we're on our way, 30 minutes go by, hey are you, you guys okay, everything okay um, yeah, we're, we're, just, we're just running a little bit behind. We're on our way. I waited over two hours for those guys at Plaza Lanes. Now, hindsight, I was probably just naive. They didn't want to go bullying with their pastor. That's probably what the case was. But they eventually showed up. You know, I, I was not going to be the reason why they didn't go bowling with me that day. We had an agreement. I told them that I was going to do this. I told them that I was going to pay for their bowling. I told them that I was going to meet them there. And I was not going to be the excuse of why their pastor didn't show up that day. Can I just remind you that God has an offer on the table of His presence, of His joy and His peace, and that offer is good. And it's oftentimes we don't receive the promises of God because God is sitting in Plaza Lane's parking lot and we're off busy doing other things. Well, we just need to get to Plaza parking lot to be with God. How many here what I'm saying. His promises are good and they're never void and, and they're on the table. What he speaks, he means and God's timing might be different, hear me, might be different than your preference, but his promises are yes and amen. The first thing that will help us secure the promises of God is that we have to live a life that is full of the Spirit of God. Now, if you're a Bible scholar, you're going to look at verses 1 through 9 that we just read and say, where in the world did you pull that from our text? That's horrible expository preaching, Pastor Austin. Well, the truth is, I didn't pull that from our text. But the truth is, is that living a life that is full of the Spirit of God is essential to securing the promises that God has for us. Pastor Brian spoke about it last week. I'll hit the nail again this week. We need the Spirit of God to fill us. We see in Numbers 27 and Deuteronomy 34 that Joshua was a man full of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God that brings wisdom and discernment and guided him and led him and empowered him and enabled him to do the things that God would have him to do. How does living full of the Spirit help you secure God's promises? First off, it enables you to identify God's promises. Turn to your neighbor and say, identify Right? We all share some promises that I would consider corporate promises. What do I mean by corporate promises? I, I mean, these are meant for all believers. Anyone who would consider them a follower of Christ, we share a corporate promise, and they are found in Scripture. What are these promises like? It's like when Jesus says, go and I will be with you always. I promise you to send the gift of the Holy Spirit. How about this promise? In this world you will have Troubles. Oh, we don't like that promise, right? Like, oh, let's re remove that promise from our, our nice, cushiony Christian life. Like, we, we don't want that promise. But corporate prom promises are much easier to identify as they are found in Scripture. But how many know that we also have individual promises? How many have ever felt God speak something to their spirit and speak something to their heart? And, and you feel like God has, has, has spoken something to you? I know that I have. There's been times where I feel like I'm supposed to let go of something or someone or a position or whatever it is. And I'm fearful and I hear the Lord say, Austin, trust me. You need to let go of this. I've got something greater for you. I've got something greater for them. You can't be everything for all these people. I've felt the Lord speak to me and say, trust me. 
Like this situation that you're worrying about, that you're spending so much time thinking about, this is out of your control and it's in my control. I've got this situation in control. Trust me, that is a promise of God. And we need the Spirit of God to discern those individual promises. Now, I personally don't believe that when God spoke to Moses or when God spoke to Joshua that his audible voice was heard at all times. I believe that in Scripture there are times where the scripture specifies that God spoke in an audible voice, but I believe in a similar manner, in the same way that you and I hear the Spirit of God now, that's how the prophets heard from God, a gentle nudge in their spirit, a gentle, small whisper. Joshua needed the Spirit to hear God's promises for him and all of Israel. Now, many people confuse God's promises and the world's promises because they don't live a life full of the Spirit which gives us discernment. Your desires and God's promises will not align until you live your life full of the Spirit of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? We like to take what the world promises us or our fleshly desires and the things that we desire and we like to impose them on God's desires for our life. When you live a life full of the Spirit, all of a sudden, God's promises, your, your desires begin to form around God's promises and the way that you think and the things that you desire and the things that you want and the, and the things that you pursue, they begin to revolve around the promises of God because you are in tune with the Spirit and His leading. What is God speaking to you this morning? What is God speaking to you over your family? What is God speaking to you over your marriage, over your finances, over your job situation? Not only does living full of the Spirit help you identify those individual promises, but it helps you attain God's promises. Turn to your neighbor and say, attain. Apart from God, you can do little. Hear me, Joshua could never penetrate Jericho's walls. Joshua could never make the sun stand still in his own power. Apart from God, he wasn't that effective. In verses 3 and 5, I'm paraphrasing, but God is promising to Joshua, I will give you every place where you set your foot. I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. I will be with you wherever you go. Notice the correlation between the promises for Joshua and the proximity of God. Hear me this morning. God's promises are tied to His presence. God's promises are directly correlated to His presence. Joshua wasn't going to be able to secure his promise by himself. He needed God's provisions. And remember, the main character of the book of Joshua is who? It's God. Right? God is straight up flexing on these nations. He's saying, look at me. Step aside, AI. Step aside, Jericho. I am the Lord your God. I am the God. And this is a story about what God has done. And, and Joshua is just kind of nuzzling up next to God and saying, okay, I'll receive that promise. Thanks, God. God, you go ahead. Boom! He knocks down the walls. Okay, I'll be here. And Joshua, because he's in proximity, he's in the presence of God, he is reaping the benefits of being in the presence of God. Walk closely with God and watch promise after promise after promise be fulfilled. There's a direct correlation between that. But too often, we want God's promises, but we don't want his presence. We want the milk and honey, but we don't want to abide by God's standards. Jesus said, peace, I leave you, but we'd rather have our CNN and our Fox News, which just leaves me feeling so peaceful. We want to get from point A to point B, but we don't want to enjoy the walk with our Lord and Savior and Creator to get to point B. And the lessons that he learns, listen, the presence of God is where promises are fulfilled. If God wants to, to take you through town and not take 235 bypass, you better be on board with that. If he wants to stop for a Coke and a burger, you better be on board with it. The problem is, is some of you are looking at your promise and, and you've been promised a cantaloupe, but right now God has a seed in his hand and you're saying, I don't understand God. He promised me a cantaloupe. And he's saying, there's time. There's time that's going to take place in this, Right? We need to be a people that are full of the Spirit of God, and we need to be okay in His timing. Walk closely with God and just watch Him work. 
Which leads me to the second thing that helps you secure the promises of God, and that's living obedient to God's instruction. Take a look at verses 6 through 8 in our text again. The Lord is speaking to Joshua. He says, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give to them. Be strong and courageous. Be careful to obey what? All. A la carte Christianity doesn't work. Sorry. We don't, get to, we don't get to pick and choose. Culture does not define what is right and wrong. Morality is stemmed from God. If there was no God, we would have no morality. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. This is just an echo of the promise or the covenant that was made between God and Moses years prior, right? This is, this is God just reminding Joshua of the agreement. This is, re, this is God just reminding Joshua, hey, I'm at Plaza Lanes and I'm going to be there and this is what you've got to do to receive your pizza and bowling, right? This is just a refresher course for Joshua, but here's how being full and being obedient are tied together. And this is very important, so please hear me. Joshua would not succeed because he obeyed God's instruction. Joshua would succeed because God was with him to enable him to obey his instruction. The same is true for you and me. We do not succeed in obeying the Lord in our own strength. We need Christ in us to enable us to obey Him. Do you see how that presence enables us to obey? Christianity is not taxing. It's impossible to obey without being filled. Are you tired? It's possible that you aren't full because you're doing it in your own strength. Do you feel like Christianity is just this long list of do's and don'ts? While there are guidelines and there are standards and there are things that the Lord asks us to do, if you would simply be full and have your mind transformed by meditating on the law, you would begin to desire and want and long the things that God wants you to long. And now you're doing the things that God wants you to do out of a relationship, out of a flow, because God has changed you and not out of a, oh, I've got to earn my way to heaven. You guys understand what I'm saying? We need to be full and it's impossible to obey without being filled. But being filled is step one to obedience, but becoming knowledgeable is step two. It's impossible to be obedient if you remain ignorant. What do I mean by that? I have people come up to me and I share this often. Austin, what am I supposed to do? Where am I supposed to go? I've got this conflict and this conflict. What should I do in this conflict? You know what I tell them? Get in the word of God. Why? Because you begin to familiarize yourself with what God would have you do and how he would have you respond and how you'd live your life. And then when God asks you to do something, you would identify that something as a God thing and you just stink and do it. You wouldn't have to ask questions, is this right or wrong? You know it's right or wrong because you have meditated on his word. When was the last time you really dug into the word of God? Honestly, when was the last time? We need to be a people that really get the word of God in our heart. The amount of wrong theology that I see shared on social media is alarming. We have got to get into God's word and we have to be spirit filled so that he can give us discernment. So that he can help us identify and we can recognize when it's God speaking and when it's something else. If you're new to Christianity and you're like, I don't even know where to begin, start in the book of James. The book of James is a great book. It's super easy, super palatable to understand. And if you haven't already signed up for Right Now Media, go to our website, newhope.church. Sign up for Right Now Media. Go to Francis Chan's Bible study on, on the book of James, and he breaks it down so easy. That's a great first place to start. Obedience takes faith, hard work, perseverance, and sacrifice. Can you imagine being Joshua? Hey, Joshua, what, what did God tell, tell, uh, tell us to do? And Joshua's like, well, I've, 
God spoke to me and, and he said to march around the city seven times and then yell. That would take some stinking faith. Like I would not want to be like the bearer of that news. Be like, what's the plan? Well, we're going to march. What's the plan? I'm going to take my staff and stick it in the water. Well, you know, what's the plan? We're just going to wade out in the water with the Ark of the Covenant, the most prized possession of God, and we're just going to go out in the water, right? Like that would take some faith. But you know what I believe Joshua had before he ever was asked to do something crazy? I believe he had faith. Why? Because he was being around the fulfilled promises of God all the time under Moses. Moses would hear something from God, no matter how crazy it would be, and he would step out in faith, and he saw God respond in that faith. Parents and grandparents... You will transfer the level of faith that you have to your children and grandchildren. You know why I believe for big things? You know why I I have a, a great faith? Because my parents demonstrated a great faith. I saw them act in obedience when it didn't make sense. I saw them respond to God when it, when it went against what culture would tell them to do. And I watched God show himself faithful time in and time out again. Listen, the lineage that you are leaving, you are Moses preparing a Joshua to prepare to lead a nation into the promises of God. Are you willing to have faith? Start exercising it and it will grow. You're never going to get bigger biceps by laying on the couch. You get bigger biceps by doing push-ups. It helps your back too, so my wife tells me. How many of you ever moved? Moved houses? I hate moving. <laughs> it's like the worst thing in the world. It is thinking hard work. The only good thing about moving is what? Decluttering. Right? Like getting rid of all that stuff. That stuff that, oh, I think I could probably trim down and fit into that. Uh-uh, sorry, that was 30 years ago, lady. You know, this, this is, this is a, uh, a hard move for Joshua. Can you imagine being Joshua and the Israelite leaders moving millions of people across the wilderness? And then not just doing that, but then dividing up what land they get. Dividing up disputes between families and tribes. Can, th- that would be so hard. I can hardly order a Chipotle bowl without being overwhelmed by the amount of decisions. And that's hard enough work for me. That's hard work. In order to get to their promise, it took hard work and perseverance. How many have ever taken a long road trip with kids? I'm talking like 10, 12 hours with a 5, 3, and 2-year-old. Anybody done that? Yeah, we do that often. You know what it takes? Perseverance. The ninth hour gets there and the hotel sounding really good, but we're going to persevere. We're going to push through. Can you just imagine all the grumbling from all the Israelites? Why are you making us pack up and leave again? Why are you giving these tribes their land first? Why don't you start with me? Why don't you do this? Man, that must have taken an extreme amount of perseverance. But more than just faith, more than just hard work, more than perseverance, it took sacrifice. Can you imagine the men leaving their children and wives to go out and fight? Many losing their lives. Blood was shed to receive the promise. Can you imagine the possessions that were left behind, the sacrifices were made? What sacrifice do you need to make today to receive your promise tomorrow? We like things handed to us. We like things easy. We want to harvest, but we don't want to prep the soil, plant the seed, and pull the weeds, water, and repeat. It's possible that the only thing, and hear me in the spirit of love, this is my heart this morning, I love you guys, but it is possible that the only thing standing between you and your promise is you. Your lack of discipline, your lack of perseverance, your lack of hard work, your lack of sacrifice, Giving up is the birth of regret. Some of you guys are so close. You are so close to achieving the promise that God has for you. It takes hard work. God didn't promise you a rose garden. It's going to be a process. You might feel like you're in the wilderness. Like you can totally identify with the Israelites right now. You've been in the wilderness for 40 years. Can you imagine just saying... Oh, you guys go on, I'll I'll watch from here. You just sit down in the wilderness when you are about ready to walk through it. Some of you are there to that point. Have faith, work hard, persevere and sacrifice. Let's 
attain and secure the promises that God has for us. As the musicians come, I want to take a look at verse 2. It says this, Now then, you and all these people get ready. Let me read that again. Now then, you and all, remember I had you note that at the very beginning? All these people get ready. Get ready to cross the Jordan into the land I've promised them. God was calling all of Israel to capture the promise. What would have happened if only half of Israel would have went forward and tried to capture the land? Do you think it would have went well for them? No. Hear me this morning. It is possible that your obedience to God's instruction could be the answer to someone else's promise from God. If God is telling you to do something, do it. You might never know the end result, but we are not rewarded by our results. We are rewarded by our obedience. And I live for the day when I get to heaven and Jesus says, well done, thy good and faithful servant. You overachieved. Every time I asked you, Austin, to do anything, whether it was going across the street and witnessing to your neighbor, whether it was giving someone the shirt off your back, whatever it was, you were faithful. And I'm proud that you are my son. And now, you get all of this. Come take a seat by me. See, the, the story of Joshua's obedience, the story of Joshua's fullness of God was just a foreshadow of someone else who? Jesus. In the same way that Joshua was full and he obeyed and he captured a promise that, that changed the course of history for generations to come. Jesus was full of the Spirit. He was obedient to death on the cross so that it would change and fulfill a promise by God that we could someday live in the promised land. That we could be in heaven with Him. I'm so thankful that these stories point to God. And I ask you this morning, are you willing to live a Spirit-filled obedient life so that you can secure the promises that God has for you. And don't be fooled into thinking that this is a sermon about you because this is a bigger picture. Your obedience could be the answer to someone else's prayer. Your obedience could be a promise that is fulfilled through you for someone else. Would you stand and bow your heads and close your eyes? This might be your first time to church and you're like, I didn't even know I had any promises. What promises? I want everyone here to know that God loves you. And that there is an offer on the table for you right now to step into the promises of God. God is at Plaza Lanes and He's texting you. He's calling you. He's inviting you to step into those promises. He's inviting you to make Him Lord of your life. In Christ you find purpose, you find joy, you find peace, comfort, forgiveness, righteousness, healing, wholeness. All of those things can be yours, but it starts with the relationship with God. His promises are connected with His presence. Will you usher in the presence of God? Will you invite Him into your heart this morning? Are you willing to let God become Lord of your life? To guide you, to lead you, to empower you, to strengthen you. And for the first time today, you'd say, Pastor, I'm asking Jesus into my heart. I'm stepping into the promises of God. I need God to save me, to forgive me. I'm done living my life for myself and my self-gain. I'm turning from my own way and turning to God's way. I'm open to being filled with the Spirit of God. I choose today to put my trust into God's plan for my life, for my family's life. And for the first time today, you'd say, Austin, I want Jesus to come into my heart and save you with every eye closed and head bowed. Would you just simply raise your hand here? I just want to be able to pray for you. Is there anyone? Yes. I see you in the back. Yes, young man. Is there anyone else? Yes. 
those three that raised their hand, would you just pray this prayer after me and make, make these words your own words. Really mean these. Lord, save me. Forgive me. Heal me. Give me a new heart and a new mind. I'm sorry for what I've done. And today, I put my trust in you. I believe that you have a plan for my life. And I step into the promises that you have for me. I know that there's nothing that I can do, but my trust is in Jesus. So save me today. Set my feet on a path of righteousness. Renew my mind and my way of thinking. Give me a new lens to see this world in that I might have a godly perspective. I trust you, Jesus. Amen. If you made that in your prayer today, I want to um, just invite you, whether you're online or you're here, send me an email, austin at newhope.church, or visit me out at the, the Fresh Star Center after service, and I want to get you some material. But how many else, before we sing this song, yes and amen, how many other people here would say, Pastor Austin, there are promises in my life that are on the table. And I might need some hard work. I, I might need a pep talk. I might need some perseverance. I might need to sacrifice. And God has been just stirring like, hey, your work's not done. You might be 85 years old, but there's another promise that you're going to see fulfilled. And it's time that we go. And I'm going to empower you. You may be tired. I'm strong. You may be fearful. I have peace. You may be sad. I have joy. And he's like, let's go. Let's pony up. How many would say, I've got a promise in my life that I'm ready to secure? Yes. Yes, yes. Jesus, right now, I pray that faith would rise up in your people as we sing this song about your faithfulness, God. I pray that you begin to drop moments into people's minds and their hearts that they would see a long history of what you've done for them, Jesus. And that they would say in their heart and in their spirit, yes and amen, yes and amen. Jesus, name. Thank you, Jesus, that we can have a confidence that is secure in your nature. When you say it, you mean it, and amen and amen, because you are faithful to us, Lord. So I pray that you would fill us with a faith and your spirit to enable us to walk through whatever you would have us to walk through. And God, I pray that anyone who's feeling discouraged, anyone who's feeling abandoned, that they would feel your presence, God, and that they would just begin to welcome your presence into their lives and into their hearts and into their homes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.